certain moments in life confront us with who we really are. For better or for worse, this happened to me when I was hundreds of miles away from the closest landmass, making my way across the South Pacific Ocean on a small sailboat. But in October of 2017, I was here in San Diego and I was having a good night in a bad year. My bank account was a huge joke and I was clutching onto the bad part of a five-year relationship. I had just finished grad school and taken a position as a city climate change planner, but every day I sat alone in an office that was literally the same shade of gray all over. Gray desk, gray ceiling, gray carpet. But it's this one night in October and I leave work early, like I always do, to go to the Patagonia store in Cardiff, where there are cool events with music and beer. And that night the store is throwing a welcome home party for Liz Clark, who has just returned from a 10 year sailing trip around the world. I had never heard of Liz, and my impression of sailboats was pretty much entirely based on the 2009 hit music video in which Lonely Island is on a boat, and Andy Samberg and t Van are dancing in tuxedos all over a 200-foot mega yacht. So I basically had what amounted to a detrimental level of knowledge related to what sailing is really like, but something clicked for me. I knew instantly I had to learn to sail. The thing about boats is they're sort of like cars. It's a weird way to fill a void in your life because there are just so many smoke and mirrors involved. Everyone has a different opinion on how to sail well, and having hands-on experience is just as necessary as understanding laws that define forward motion. But I wasn't interested in laws. I wanted the quickest way onto the water, so I enrolled in the next advanced sailing course at Mission Bay. And to the club's credit, a 16-year-old working the desk said I didn't have the necessary prerequisites, but I had no problem shaming her into believing that my name had been lost in the system. <laughs> and that's how I ended up capsizing on my very first day of, of pursuing the sailing dream. My assigned buddy and I had pushed off the dock with real intention, but it only took one gust of wind to send us spinning madly in a clockwise direction. We fell into about 12 feet of water, and while we bobbed at the surface in our life jackets, the mass of the boat got wedged in the mud of Mission Bay. And I don't think we would have been able to right the boat on our own anyway, but due to the mud detail, we ended up drying off on shore while three teenage lifeguards used a jet ski to tow the boat sideways into shore. And yet, our society's addiction to accolades can be a useful thing. I was named an advanced sailor by the American Sailing Association two weeks later. The same amount of time that it took me to sit at my desk and schedule a phone call with an engineer at the Port of San Diego to talk about stormwater permits. And I was breaking in the titles at work too. I took the promotional leap from program lead to program manager. I had no clue what that was supposed to mean for me, but what was clear was that I got $2 more an hour and I had more autonomy to ditch the office early to try to sail on racing boats. Racing, sadly, turned out to be a dead end for me. I was astonishingly ill-equipped to process boat vocabulary and react to wind changes when everything was happening at hyperspeed, and the experience left me feeling like the young female outsider I was within the sailing community. Up until that point, I was dabbling in sailing as an excuse to find some bigger sense of purpose. But at a technical level, it seemed like a bizarre choice. I had no engineering or physics or mechanics background, and I just wasn't that good at it. At work, I was doing well. I was getting promoted and invited to round tables and things, except for one hiccup. In the winter of 2018, my boss made me take a kind of Myers-Briggs personality test for professionals. I put it off, but then she just wanted to check in. And finally, I took a big breath and answered 50 questions about myself. The results were not good. <laughs> Overconfident and highly individualistic blared like red alarms from the test's auto-generated pie chart. I, of course, chose to react by researching all the ways in which the test was probably flawed, but my boss was more process-oriented. How can we address this together was one of my boss's favorite questions, and she asked it while printing me a sheet of paper made to be filled in with things like personal development goals and growth milestones. Fast forward six months, and I'm bunkered down in the humid cabin, humid cabin of a 31-foot hunter, calling out navigation directions to my friend Connor, who is steering us through a reefy pass in the nation of Tonga, which consists of about 400 unique islands and atolls. Our guidebook states that there are always about 2.8 islands within sight at any given time. Connor left his job as a rocket ship engineer because he found it too boring and instead, <laughs> in, 
and definitely sailed his own boat from Los Angeles as far west as he could. He was exactly the kind of overconfident, highly individualistic, <laughs> former SpaceX employee who could get you thousands of miles across an ocean. And that's what we were planning to do. We would cross the Pacific, starting with me meeting up with Connor and Tonga, then we'd sail on to Fiji and then eventually to Australia. We haven't gone over any emergency protocols, I say lazily to Connor in the first couple weeks of the trip, <laughs> while we're enjoying easy day sails throughout Tonga. It smelled like sunscreen and birds came over to check us out every couple minutes. Connor considered the question while keeping his eyes focused on the bow. I mean, like, what would happen if you fell off the boat when we're actually out there, I say, referring to when we'll have to cross the ocean towards Fiji, when there won't be 2.8 islands within eyesight at all times. Connor locked eyes with me, just for a second, before darting them back to watch the jib. Realistically, we'd both be dead. <laughs> different than the one I left behind. Really different. I got used to sleeping with rotten bananas swinging above my bed. There were reef sharks and flying fox bats and the bugs the bats ate. There were entire days spent looking for the perfect swimming spot. But especially on those days, I felt even less sure of my path than I had felt at home. I wondered why I hadn't just been able to try harder at my job or been able to be a better girlfriend. Why had I failed in such a big way to grow up? The journey from Tonga to Fiji is about 500 miles, five nights when there is an unusually big swell, which there always is, right? By the time we had pushed off the harbor in Tonga and gotten around to that last night of my first ocean passage, I was having a bad day in an incredible year. I was sick to my stomach and had been for days, and I was tired from staying up staring into the blackness on night shift, looking for other boats that never came. There were four of us crewing on the passage, and in five days, nobody had stood up long enough to boil water. At some point, a really rough wave sent my backpack full of clothes flying out of its locker, and something in me just snapped. I wanted to exercise or look at a book without feeling sick or eat something that wasn't creamy peanut butter. I wanted to be able to go pick up my strewn out clothes without needing to throw up. Why would anyone ever do this? I yelled into nothingness. Outside, the sky everywhere was gray a salty, infinite gray, with squalls screaming in the east and west. The ocean was gray, too, shifting and sharpening itself into big metallic slices. Strung around my neck was the army green whistle-slash-compass that my boss gave me when I told her I was leaving to go sail a few thousand miles across the ocean. Connor, believing no question to be rhetorical, walked over to me with his iPad and pulled out a map of the world. We just went from here, he said, pointing to an island cluster somewhere south of the equator, to here. He slid his finger visibly across the part of the globe that is almost all dark blue, scattered with little green dots. I still couldn't properly eyeball latitude and longitude, but for the first time, I understood exactly where we were and where we were going. And by some incredible and entropic force, we kept propelling ourselves forward. On the morning of the sixth day, Fiji's green mountains burst out of the sea like the legendary volcanoes they are. I was so impatient to get to shore and buy french fries that I could have swam. <laughs> but we needed the right spot to anchor or else we risked damage to the boat. We circled around one of the outer islands a couple times and tried out some interrupted communications with the harbor masters. Eventually, using a bunch of charts plus a good dose of intuition, we settled on a spot that was perfect. Let her down, Connor shouted, because it was my job to drop the anchor. I picked the 50-pound weight up off its cradle, letting it slide overboard. I leaned over the deck to watch it sink deeper and deeper and deeper until I couldn't see it anymore, until there was just the chain and us on the boat with the water all around, and all I had to go off was a feeling in order to know when we had become grounded.